Welcome to the Global Research News Hour, produced in cooperation with CKUW FM Radio in Winnipeg and the Center for Research on Globalization at globalresearch.ca. And here's your host, Michael Welch. How credible is the evidence that Russians were responsible for the poisoning of a former double agent living in Great Britain? What revelations came out of a recent British High Court ruling looking into the apparent poisoning of Sergei Skripal and his daughter Yulia? Are there factors complicating both the investigation into the Skripal poisoning and the July 2014 shootdown of Flight MH17? Are there geopolitical and other incentives for the U.S. to implicate Russia rather than Kiev in the shooting down of MH17 that go beyond the evidence? On this week's Global Research News Hour, we take a look at two major international incidents in recent years which are being used to implicate Russia in malfeasance and explore whether that evidence is strong enough to justify the further escalation of tensions between Russia and the West. We'll first hear from Moscow-based journalist and author John Helmer about the poisoning of Sergei Skripal and a recent court finding in the matter. Then we'll hear from Case Vanderpile about a little-known fact surrounding the shootdown of flight MH17 in July 2014. On this week's program, two criminal accusations against Russia probing the Skripal affair and flight MH17. Bringing you the analysis beyond the media headlines, the Global Research News Hour is on the air. Welcome to the Global Research News Hour for the week of March 23rd, 2018. I am series host and producer Michael Welch. The Global Research News Hour is a special radio collaboration between the Center for Research on Globalization and campus community radio station CKUW 95.9 FM in Winnipeg on occupied Anishinaabe territory on the homeland of the Métis Nation. We seek to provide you with access to analysis of the major issues shaping our world today from thinkers, researchers, and unique political personalities rarely addressed by major media. Our program is available from the Center's website, globalresearch.ca. We'll begin our show with News Notes, a sampling of articles from the Global Research News site. Apparently, the U.S. has to remain in Syria out of necessity. It cannot afford to sit on the sidelines as Russia re-emerges as the major power broker in the region, eating up all the major contracts coming out of Syria, together with Iran, as it looks to poach American allies left, right, and center. Additionally, Russia recently warned the U.S. that it will not tolerate Washington's aggressive attacks on the Syrian government and will respond with strikes of their own should the U.S. military threaten Russian personnel. One should expect that eventually there will be a point where Russia will no longer allow these attacks to go unanswered. As America's power and influence wane, the time will come for both Russia and China to make their mark on the global stage. That comes from the article, Pentagon Officials Searching for a Big War Against Russia and China. A world war might sound crazy, but it could be America's last act of desperation. By Darius Shatamasebi. Posted March 22nd, originally appearing at The Anti Media. To no avail, since 2008, both Presidents Obama and Trump have followed in the footsteps of George W. Bush. Together with America's NATO allies, they have not only supported terrorist organizations, they have covertly supported terrorist insurgencies, waged an extensive bombing campaign against Libya in 2011, Syria, Yemen, and Iraq in 2014. Uh, drone attacks and targeted assassinations against Pakistan in 2004, among other military intelligence operations. Under the Kuala Lumpur Initiative to Criminalize War, which was adopted under the helm of Tun Mahathir, all national leaders who initiate aggression must be subjected to the jurisdiction of the International Criminal Court. Let us be crystal clear. Consistent with Nuremberg, the above statement applies to President Donald Trump and the heads of state and heads of government of NATO countries, which endorsed the extensive carpet bombing operations directed against Libya, Syria, Yemen, and Iraq, resulting in the death of countless civilians. 
That comes from the article, The Ultimate War Crime, America's Global War on Terrorism, The Criminalization of War is the Avenue to Reaching World Peace, by Professor Michel Chosodovsky, posted March 22nd. None of the allegations against Assad and the Syrian government withstand the scrutiny of independent investigations. None. NATO imperialists create atrocity stories to demonize target leaders and to target prey countries with a view to fabricating consent to commit the supreme international crime of war of aggression. They have been fabricating consent and committing war crimes for the past seven years in Syria. We are accomplices in these crimes when we do not denounce our criminal governments. That comes from the article, Syrians Have Names and Faces, by Mark Taliano, posted March 21st. These are just a few of the featured articles appearing last week on the Global Research website. Regular visitors to the site are encouraged to send monetary contributions by fax, mail, or online. Just go to globalresearch.ca and click Donate on the menu bar. British Prime Minister Theresa May has maintained that the only plausible explanation for the poisoning of a former Russian double agent, Sergei Skripal, and his daughter is that the Russians were responsible. Further, she referred to a nerve agent she claimed was of a type developed in Russia. Russia's foreign minister, Sergei Lavrov, has said that London has failed to provide the evidence implicating Russian responsibility for carrying out an attempted murder, and has recently claimed that May's tough stance is pushing Britain and Russia to the brink of war. Does it make sense to take the Prime Minister at her word, or are there other factors in the case that should shake the public's confidence in this narrative? To address the question, the Global Research News Hour reached out to John Helmer. He's a former political scientist and the longest continuously serving foreign correspondent in Russia. An author and journalist, he is composed a number of articles on the poisoning of the Skripals. He joined us recently by Skype to share his thoughts. Well, first of all, the OPCW had verified that all the chemical agents in Russia had been uh, eliminated. And uh, secondly, I don't think these the, the, the lab was even in Russia. It was in Uzbekistan, was it not? Yes, I think that's relatively underimportant in the sense that even if it was located in Uzbekistan, it was under Soviet command. The Russian scientists who've emerged from the woodwork, now all retired, who've spoken about the nerve, nerve agents that they produced there. Two of them are, remain in Russia. One of them uh, went to the United States to make a living there. Uh, they all are Russian. They're not Uzbekis. Um, more to the point, they all point out it was the U.S. which dismantled the Uzbek chemical warfare plant. Mm -hmm. And the, I don't believe there's much doubt that lots of countries have the capability to produce the so-called Novichok or uh, Newcomer series, of which there are many um, iterations and, and, and variations. And some of the variations, uh, as described by one of the Russian uh, chemical warfare experts, was a, uh, uh, a type that could be disseminated by powder form or liquid form, but was not a binary weapon, was not composed of relatively harmless components, which would then be mixed into a lethal combination. So there's a lot of controversy. There's a lot of difference of scientific opinion. And there's, there's no way one can cr speculate credibly about what happened. Mm -hmm. Therefore, what the British government has done, since they're not exactly fools, is to have speculated for their domestic political advantage. And that's Mrs. May's political advantage to keep uh, the Tories ahead of the Labour Party. They were not before this affair. To, to lift her approval rating in relation to uh, Mr. Corbyn, the Labour leader, who was well ahead until this affair. And for Mrs. May to defeat uh, prime ministerial challenges like Boris Johnson, the Foreign Secretary, and Philip Hammond, the Chancellor of the Exchequer, both of whom have made the case to the other Tories in Parliament that Mrs. May isn't tough enough. 
So it's best to see um, this affair in the great words of Tip O'Neill of Massachusetts, all politics is local. So the um, you have to understand, I believe, that Mrs. May is playing to the domestic constituency and probably gaining as a result. Will she bring the rest of the world closer to war with Russia? Well, she doesn't care. Hmm. I found the story reminded me of the Iraq weapons of mass destruction claims that uh, they uh, they managed like where they, if, as the saying goes, they sort of built the uh, the the evidence or shaped the evidence around the policy. Um, yes. Now you're pointing there to domestic politics. Do you not see? Uh, a motive uh, in, uh, I mean, do you not uh, agree uh, a possible motive might also be some sort of alliance with Washington, who is uh, very uh, motivated, apparently, in, in, in provoking more uh, enmity in the public eyes against P uh, President Putin? Well, we can speculate about that. Uh, clearly, it's a it's a Mr. reasonable Trump motive. Though. Has has a slightly different opinion at least some time in the day, uh, when he congratulated uh, Putin on the electoral win and then failed to follow the script that some of his advisers had written out on cards for him, either because he failed to read or because he disagreed or because he had some other idea in his head at that moment. So, uh, unprecedented event, uh, White House staff leaked their briefing cards for the president. That's never happened before. It's never happened in any administration I've ever worked with or followed in my lifetime. So, the Americans are a pile of contradictions themselves. Uh, the appointment of um, John Bolton, uh, a rabid warmonger, as National Security Advisor is another example of uh, the disarray in which the United States government uh, currently is in relation to Russia, to China, and to North Korea, and to Syria. They're the principal enemies and the principal fronts in which the U.S. hawks wish to operate. Ah, sorry, I left out Iran. I mean, you, could, you can imagine five different wars. And that will just about destroy the rest of the world if um, if they go in the direction that some of them want to go in. But how can we gauge which way they'll go in? It's it's difficult to say. And and in the way in my line of work, I try to stick to um, what's provable. What's provable and what is proved not to have happened. I, I speculate as to why. The script balls were poisoned. Who benefits? Who gains? Who did it? I can't do that, Michael. It's too early, and I'm not sure that we'll ever know. Uh, after all, it's four years now since the shootdown of uh, Malaysian Airlines MH17 over the Ukraine, and we still don't really know uh, how it was done, why it was done, or by whom it was done. John Helmer explained that he does not think Sergei Skripal was a particularly significant intelligence asset for the British side. When he was betraying uh, the, the Russian side for the British, he, his uh, work involved handing over a telephone directory for GRU, some information about the one of the Russian uh, space cosmodromes in Kazakhstan, stuff that was pretty low level. You can you can be sure that it was low level because this prison sentence was very short by spy standards, by American or Russian or British espionage standards. He wasn't shot. He got, I believe, 13 years, and he was exchanged. Uh, after four or five or six, I can't recall which. So his real value to the British and to the Russians when he was an active double agent was small. And uh, from all accounts, he received about $100,000 worth over several years. In other words, about 20000 a year. That's poultry. That's peanuts. 
So I think from the hints that the Guru has given not to influence public opinion against Skripal, the, the conclusion is he was a relatively minor creature, uh, uh, playing a very minor role for a very small sum of money for a very small jail sentence who was exchanged for people of much greater value to the Russian side. Then he disappears into England, and unlike some of his other colleagues, he has no exposure to the press, he doesn't write an autobiography, he doesn't do anything to make a name for himself. Um, and the rest, you, you and the listeners can all do exactly what I've done, read the British press. Apparently, he continued to meet some of his colleagues, uh, Russian colleagues, ex or retired group of men. Apparently, he continued to meet with some of his MI6 and other British intelligence uh, colleagues. Um, apparently, he was in business with some of them. And he was seriously ill with uh, diabetes. He had medical problems. He had money problems. You can check from the quality of his house. He lived modestly. So uh, what does one learn about this fellow? That he was of very minor importance. That has led to all sorts of speculation, particularly broadcasting on the Russian side, that it's a vulgar and unpleasant thing to say and I'm persuasive, that it wasn't worth a state effort to assassinate him. I don't think that proves anything either way. It's a vulgar and an unnecessary thing to say. The issue here is uh, whether the evidence, both uh, the nerve agent evidence, the blood sampling evidence, and other evidence indicates an official or professional assassination attempt. And if it does, who? Uh, and I, I, I mean, there are, you can have a variety of theories. My sources have theories. And, and you, you might discuss theories over a beer, but not on a serious radio program like yours, Michael. <laughs> Appreciate that. Uh, you forwarded to me uh, you, a recently posted article, uh, the headline, The Screeple Case Goes to Court for the First Time, New Uncertainties for the British and Russian Governments. And uh, it uh, talks about how British High Court Justice David Williams issued the first court adjudication, adjudication yep. thank you, of evidence presented by the British government of what happened to Sergei Skripal and uh, his daughter. Uh, in Salisbury on the 4th of March. Uh, maybe just give us kind of a, a quick, quick synopsis of that article and why it's so important. It's very important because this is the first time the case went to a court. Now, for since March the 4th, um, allegations have been made about what happened and who did it. The evidence is not being presented, but in this particular court case, um, it's a special court, the Court of Protection, part of the High Court's family division. That's the division of the court that takes care of vulnerable people, persecuted people, incapacitated people, mentally ill people, people who can't readily instruct lawyers to act for them, who may not understand or may be too ill to act in their own best interests. So the court has to act in the best interests of the applicant. In this particular case, the British government, through the Home Office, the Salisbury uh, I, uh, National Health Trust, the hospital, and a barrister and solicitor appointed to represent the Skripals applied to the judge to authorize the uh, fresh blood sampling and the disclosure of medical records, they would normally be things that a normal per person in full capacity and would give his cons or her consent to, right? In this particular case, this court case, which was heard in closed, behind closed doors earlier this week in London, went 
and try to create the legal structure so that the Organization for the Prevention of Chemical Weapons, OPCW, which is in the Netherlands, can come across the, to Britain and make their own investigation according to the Convention on Chemical Weapons, which Russia and Britain endorse. Now, the Russian side has insisted on this from the beginning. Mrs. May, Mr. Johnson, the British cabinet have tried an end run around it. Now, facing general condemnation, if not stated obviously and explicitly by the Europeans, but general condemnation that they rush to judgment, the British are saying, we're going to comply with the OPCW procedures and according to the treaty which we signed, and we will comply with what the Russians ask by having an independent OPCW investigation. To make that independent, the OPCW has to take blood samples. Blood samples of the two Skripals in order to establish what nerve agent may have been used in order then to match those samples with any uh, chemical warfare traces or identifiers that Porton Down Laboratory, the British Chemical Weapons Laboratory, um, uh, has kept records of and samples of and so on. Second, the blood samples will be used to generate a DNA match to see if the blood sampling that's done by OPCW matches the blood sampling that the British did uh, uh, at the beginning of the investigation. The British sampling would not be admissible in court because there's no, no chain, secure chain of custody of the evidence to prevent tampering. And the Russian side made it very clear in a statement issued by the Foreign Ministry in Moscow on March 21. So the court case has been in a sense an answer to Russian demands for the British to behave legally. The puzzle about it, about the court case and the judgment, is that it reveals that the Russians didn't know and weren't allowed into the court case to represent the Skripals. Now, the Russian side has been saying, look, Yulia Skripal is a Russian citizen. She's been attacked. She's close to death in a hospital, and we demand under the consular and international conventions access to her to see what her condition is and represent her as a Russian citizen with Russian family and roots. The Russian side says they've been denied all this access. The British court confirms no access. Indeed, the lawyer for the Skripals, allegedly independent, says that no practical law or appropriate uh, references being made to, to anyone in Russia, family members of the Skripals, relatives of the Skripals, anyone, uh, as if the, the Russian state hasn't been attempting to make contact. So that you have this closed-door hearing, which provides new evidence, which I'll come to in a minute, but keeps the Russians out in order to allow the OPCW to take samples to, to, to investigate just as the Russian side has demanded. It's very peculiar. Mm. It, it's very unusual. But since it's the first court case, it tells you something about the quality of British justice here. And here we come to a second major discovery in the judgment. Now, bear in mind this was a closed-door hearing over three days there were two witnesses from Portendown, the chemical warfare specialists. There was um, the clinician, the doctor, attending the Skripals to describe their condition and what the medical records show. All this was kept behind closed doors. Russian intelligence agents, who hadn't been booted out by Mrs. May um, last during this week, apparently didn't know this court case was even going on because the Russian side didn't protest that they should have been represented. They didn't provide any lawyers themselves, which is another question. Still, there were five witnesses, including a home office and foreign office, Porton Down in the hospital. 
The judge decided that he would give a private judgment, closed doors judgment, but then would issue a public version and that's the version you can read on my website today. It was issued yesterday in London. Some of the British papers have picked it up. Like all the rest of the British press, they can't read the document for what it tells you. And listeners might struggle to understand its significance. But all you have to do is persist with a bottle of beer at the small print, and then you discover these remarkable things, first of all. The summary the judge gives of the Port and Down evidence is that a nerve agent of the Novichok class or, a, or closely related to it was found in trace in the blood samples of the Skripals. Now, that doesn't say Russia. It doesn't say manufactured in Russia. It doesn't say Russian origin at all. In fact... It's a very loose description of what caused the, the, um, the attack. Okay. It doesn't identify source. That's very important. That doesn't mean that the Prime Minister May has been lying or that uh, Foreign Secretary Johnson has been lying. They've been exaggerating. Mm -hmm. That's true. But they've been referring to evidence beyond the chemical evidence. So in one of the stories I've reported, I've urged people to look for what other types of evidence might there be for the British to be so convinced there was an official Russian assassination operation. And that includes electronic monitoring, which you can pick up at least retrospectively. You can tell how much mobile telephone traffic there was in the centre of Salisbury around the screw piles from, let's say, 1 o'clock in the afternoon till 4.15 when they were discovered on the bench. You can tell whether the electronic traffic was encrypted. That increases the likelihood you've got sophisticated people communicating in a special way. If there's nothing like that, then you know there wasn't an official assassination attempt. What you can be sure of, not to get everybody's conspiratorial instincts and whiskers twitching here, what you can be sure of is that the British are not going to announce publicly all of the types of evidence they've got, especially if they haven't got any. Mm. So this is a court case, the very first which tells, shows a glimpse into what Porton Down knows. Well, it's not a convincing case about Russian origin at all. It also opens the window to mistakes, ignorance, and possibly negligence on the Russian side in failing to provide lawyers for Yulia Skripal. The hospital, for example, told the court nobody connected to the Skripals, had made any contact since they fell ill. Well, I rang the hospital to ask how they were. But I don't qualify because I'm a reporter. Did any member of the Skripal family in Russia make contact? Did they make contact through the government? Did, they, did the government consider having lawyers, British lawyers, going to court? and apply for habeas corpus, a, a, a traditional British method for producing evidence relating to a person who's being detained against their will. Being sick in a hospital is being detained. You can have habeas corpus in court. You, you oblige the authorities, whoever it is, in, in this case the hospital and the home office and police, to explain why and how and so forth. All of this stuff... The Russian government could have done a lot better at managing than they have. Mm. They have fallen for the British propaganda war, and I'm trying to bring us back to some basis on which the two powerful governments in the world are at serious odds with one another over what's happened to these two unfortunate individuals. We just spoke with Moscow-based author and journalist John Helmer. An archive of his articles can be found at the website johnhelmer.net.
You're listening to the Global Research News Hour, broadcast out of Winnipeg on campus community radio station CKUW 95.9 FM and on the Progressive Radio Network at prn.fm. We are also podcast on the website globalresearch.ca. On July 17, 2014, an aircraft, Malaysian Airlines Flight 17, was shot down over eastern Ukraine airspace, killing 283 passengers and 15 crew on board. The Dutch Safety Board released its final report on the incident in October of 2015, saying a surface-to-air Buk missile was responsible. In September 2016, the Joint Investigation Team released its findings that a Buk missile was indeed responsible and that it had been fired from rebel territory and that the system which fired the missile had been transported from Russia the day of the crash. Case Vanderpile released a book recently, the English version of which is entitled Flight MH17 and the New Cold War. Case Vanderpile is a professor emeritus of international relations at the University of Sussex and former director of the Center for Global Political Economy. He's currently active with the Dutch anti-fascist resistance, having served as its president. In September of 2017, he was in Winnipeg and the Global Research News Hour had an opportunity to interview him about the book. I, I, w- I would say, without uh, overstating my case, that you might uh, dismiss both official reports, so the final report of the Dutch Safety Board, um, which had taken on the investigation of the technical aspects on behalf of both Ukraine and the Netherlands, uh, and uh, the last report, there will be more, but the last report of the Joint Investigation Team, which is a, a larger group of countries involved in the whole process, you might dismiss them as completely well, not completely irrelevant, because in what they leave out, what they don't mention, and where they fail, and where they actually misrepresent the situation on the basis of known facts, uh, they are highly meaningful, of course. It's, it's very important to see what they, for one reason or another, may even be coincidence. What they don't mention, of course, is and misrepresent, is in itself important. That, that cannot be entirely without a reason. guilty demeanor. Yeah, yeah, I would say, well, the, the, the one factor that uh, completely undermines uh, both uh, reports or both streams of reporting is the role of uh, the, the veto that has been uh, granted to uh, the Kiev uh, regime that came to power in a coup in uh, February 2014. And the fact that uh, the rulers in Kiev may uh, forbid uh, certain facts to come out and that you know, you can you can actually detail at which moment and un, under which circumstances these vetoes were granted. Makes clear that obviously they are a party of something very important to hide, because otherwise you wouldn't demand uh, such a stringent restriction on the pursuit of the investigation. It sounds similar to uh, the the 9/11 Commission, in which the director uh, Philip Zelico had the ability to uh, to vet the. The information going into it, so oh, yeah, some yeah. of the more yeah, yeah, I guess so, I guess so, and there, there are many similarities. Although I wouldn't simply compare the two, because of course, uh, in the series of blogs that I write on this, and for our anti-war site in uh, in Holland, uh, is called "Will MH17 be our 9/11?" Uh, but it's still with a question mark, because whereas 9-11 gave us the war on terror, which is basically a war against the world that is spreading every half year, uh, you can't say that uh, the war, the civil war in Ukraine has, has led to more than a bolstering of the NATO uh, alliance at a very critical moment, because, uh, you know, in the, in, this, in the autumn of 2014, NATO had a very important upcoming conference for which everybody expected uh, that the the debacle in Afghanistan uh, would be a major uh, bone of contention. And uh, here suddenly they get the gift of uh, having uh, being able to paint Putin as as the immediate threat to European security and so on. So in that sense, um, uh, it hasn't led to a, a major war in Europe, but it has led to an influx of American troops uh, to all kind of maneuvers and provocations in the Baltic Sea uh, and especially in the uh, in the Baltic countries and in Poland, 
and of course in Ukraine itself, where we are still looking at a slow-burning fuse that might lead to an explosion any time. That, that is a very uncertain factor. Could you point to some of the uh, international um, indicators before the shooting down of the, uh, of the flight yeah. that uh, might lead us to believe that uh, this is, there's something suspicious about this oh, yes, flight being yes, shot yes. down? I mind you that, that the book is set up in such a way that in the beginning I already say that I don't know who actually pulled the trigger in this case. Uh, even what was the sort of weapon that downed the plane. I don't know these things. But the book is set up uh, by listing all the facts that we can know and that we can see for ourselves and then slowly getting to the point where you almost can conclude and sometimes very tempting to uh, say, well, it must have been, in, as I would say, the Kiev regime with NATO uh, connivance. Well, but it's, I'm uh, not it's sure. pretty principal uh, to, to in, a, in any investigation to establish who had the motive. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, as I say, and that's something that's completely ignored by the official investigations. But if you want to sum up briefly, what are the um, circumstances that makes one that make one believe that uh, Kiev? plus NATO advisors at least, was complicit, was most complicit. Then of course you have to look at the expansion of NATO, you have to look at the attempts to bring Ukraine and Georgia into the NATO alliance, which in 2008 of course led to a reckless military adventure, which is routinely called in the media the, the Russian invasion, but it was actually in a, a, a military attempt by um, Saakashvili of uh, Georgia to recapture uh, some uh, you know, uh, dissident provinces. Um, that, that is, that is uh, one factor. Uh, you have to look at the energy equation in which after uh, Gazprom, the Russian gas monopoly, had established a, uh, a pipeline uh, under the North Sea, under the Baltic Sea, which is called Nord Stream, uh, that they wanted to expand that by uh, a pipeline under the Black Sea, which was called South Stream, and which would land in Bulgaria. Uh, that was a major issue because whereas Nord Stream had not been prevented, uh, the West, at all costs, the United States mainly and Britain, wanted to prevent the creation of South Stream. And uh, the whole the story that which is in the book about how they put pressure under Bulgaria to drop uh, its willingness to receive uh, the, the pipeline and so on and so forth is in itself very telling about which measures were being taken. Now in connection with that you can see that the Western navies were penetrating the Black Sea and under the treaty uh, provisions they can remain there if they're not part of the border, of, if they're not bordering themselves on the Black Sea they can remain there for 21 days and the United States was very prominent. And after the coup in February, in, um, you know, the coup occurred on the back of popular demonstrations that were authentic protests against the uh, rapaciousness of the Ukrainian oligarchs then in power. Other oligarchs were waiting in the wing and hoping, uh, hoping to utilize a popular uprising so that they could take over central power, which is what happened. Um, but uh, after the coup, uh, it was clear that the uh, new government, the coup government of ultra-nationalist Ukrainians, from mainly from the west of the country, wanted to end the agreement with Russia to uh, lease the naval port of Sebastopol, which is basically the uh, holds the key to the to naval control, to maritime control of the of the Black Sea. And if you if you that if you combine that with um, uh, the advance of NATO uh, to Ukraine and, you know, trying to get Ukraine and, and Georgia along, you can imagine that it's, uh, it's a purely, it, it's fully in the line of expectation to see at one point U.S. naval squadrons or NATO naval squadrons entering the uh, port of Sebastopol after the Russians had left. Now that, that in connection again with South Stream, which already was in the, on the rocks when MH17 happened, um, gives you a sense that we're also looking at a struggle for uh, military dominance in the Black Sea area because it's mostly surrounded by NATO uh, states. Turkey was then still entirely in line with the, with the West. So that's, that's one important dimension. 
The United States is very keen to, pre to actually disrupt the supply of Europe, of the EU, with Russian gas. And, um, uh, but they are also concerned about uh, the rise of the, the BRICS countries uh, as a rival bloc against Western austerity. And uh, interestingly enough, uh, in mid-July um, uh, 2014, uh, Putin was traveling through Latin America and uh, ending up in Brazil where he met the other leaders of the BRICS uh, countries and they put their signatures under the charter of a BRICS bank. Not much has come of this BRICS bank but that wasn't clear at the time. At the time it looked as if a, a veritable challenge to IMF World Bank dominance of world international trade and payment arrangements had been put in place. And the United States were most concerned about that and were also very concerned about something that happened on the margins of that uh, uh, BRICS um, bank uh, event. And that was a contact between Putin and Chancellor Merkel, who happened to be also in Brazil for the finals of the World Football, uh, Football Championship. And he agreed with her the Land for Gas Agreement. Uh, and the land for gas agreement was basically to settle the Ukrainian conflict, to allow, to, to yield uh, control of Crimea to Russia, and in exchange for that to have Russia uh, sign up to a, a multi-billion uh, rehabilitation prog program for Ukraine, cheap gas, etc. Many details can still be added. All that happened before uh, July 17, which was a fatal date for the plane. And on 16 July, when Putin was still in uh, Fortaleza in Brazil, uh, the United States issued new sanctions. And key among those sanctions were sanctions targeting the energy sector, targeting the supply of Europe with Russian gas in all kinds of ways. South Stream, as I said, was already on the rocks, etc. Of course, I, I can't say and I can't prove that they were also very upset about the uh, Merkel-Putin agreement on, uh, because that is based on journalistic information, quality stuff, I would say, but not of the same documentary uh, status as the other issue. The United States issues these sanctions, calls in all the EU ambassadors uh, at the State Department and tells them this has to be followed now by the EU because Russia is supplying the rebels and so on and so forth. The EU holds a meeting also on 16 July and there they can't reach agreement. They give out a declaration which actually in the course of the day of 17 July became public and in that declaration is included as a last paragraph, it's not a long declaration, but as a last paragraph is included the need to start triangular uh, discussions and negotiations between the EU, Russia and Ukraine on, sec on the security of the gas uh, supply, energy supply. The United States is yeah. in there. <laughs> no, you, but, the, but the United States is not part of that. That's an EU declaration. Later in the day, uh, MH17 is, being, is downed. Immediately after that, all kinds of things uh, happen, of course, an enormous uproar in the West. Uh, very doubtful claims uh, about who did it, contradictory claims, uh, and that, that's something that we can leave aside for the moment. And on 22 uh, July, so five days after the event, um, the EU comes with has, a, has another meeting, at, uh, actually at the foreign minister level, and they come with a replica of the US sanctions, so they yield to the uh, American sanctions and, and endorse them. And interestingly enough, the whole aspect of the energy triangular discussions has been uh, has disappeared and is replaced by a last paragraph which says that the sanctions should particu in particular target the energy sector, which basically means that the EU tells itself to shut off its own gas supply because it's not so easy to think where the alternative gas would come from. Of course, the United States wants to sell its... Uh, the, 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 the gas that it obtains by fracking and that it ships to Europe uh, as liquid, uh, petro liquid uh, natural gas. Uh, but that's far more expensive than the gas it receives from the exist through the existing pipelines from uh, Russia. Now that, that I think 
is, is a very important because here we are talking about what happened one day before MH17 and what happened a few days after MH17. But what I try to do in the book is to show that it's never, you know, complex historical events and however odd it sounds, even shooting down a plane in the context of a civil war is a, it's ultimately a complex event because many issues are, are involved. There was, for instance, also exactly in the area where the plane came down there was a uh, an, an ukrainian so so uh, let's say a, um, a kiev uh, military detachment was isolated because there had been a military push to try and separate the two um, rebellious provinces and that had failed and there was an isolated uh, uh, detachment which somehow had to be reached uh, so that is a factor as well. There's also the military situation. Uh, there, there are absurd facts that I have been able to document on the basis of the Dutch government's own um, documentation in combination with uh, press. Uh, you know, the, pre the press can still be trusted, but only one day. That is the first day when they report on things that, that become public before the so-called news image has or the consent the narrative is established yes, itself. Yes, when, when a reporter simply yeah. said, I heard a bang, and two days later it's better not to report that bang anymore. Yeah. But in this case, uh, the, interestingly, the newspapers also reported on the fact that the Dutch government, yeah, in, you would almost say in a flash of complete madness, uh, planned to dispatch uh, a brigade uh, or uh, the so-called uh, Rapid Intervention Brigade to eastern Ukraine to militarily secure the area where the plane had come down on the grounds that it was a plane mostly containing Dutch uh, victims. Now, of course, that would have been a casus belli for, for Russia because you can imagine when, when a, one of the crack Dutch military units suddenly appears in eastern Ukraine, fully armed and, and you know, landing from the air, etc., Luckily for us and for the world, I guess, uh, this brigade is part of a joint division with Germany, uh, which also provides half of the so-called quick reaction division. And uh, the German commander, I guess, uh, on instructions from his own government, immediately dismissed uh, this operation as complete madness. So it, it didn't, in the end, happen. But to give you a sense of the risks that we were talking about, the confusion that happens, and. And also, it reminds you of the fact that so many more factors are involved. There's, for instance, the whole, the coup itself in February 2014 was already accompanied by a sort of economic coup in the sense that uh, heavy industry from uh, Ukraine was being uh, exposed to competition and neglect, whereas uh, intensive agriculture uh, with EU and, and American agribusiness uh, involvement was stepped up. Uh, Poroshenko, the current president, a completely corrupt uh, figure, but then the other oligarchs are of course also corrupt, uh, is a product also of the, the shift in the Ukrainian economy from heavy industry, which was mostly in Donetsk and you know, Akhmetov was the famous oligarch associated with that uh, block of forces, but Poroshenko represents light industry and the food uh, sector, and he and his entourage of uh, people who are active in poultry industry and in uh, agriculture uh, were looking very much to the EU as a form of reinforcing their economic position. So there's no way in which you can reduce even this single event to one single let's say, evil figure who had some devilish plan, etc., etc. We're looking at, at the dramatic unfolding of a, a coming together of endless streams of, of different, sometimes interconnected, sometimes unconnected uh, developments. And in, in the book I even list uh, things that, uh, for instance, all the types of armament that were available, who had bugs, in what state of readiness were they what sort of plane could have been involved if it were a plane what was the sort of damage to the plane etc always with the footnote i don't know who did it but look at what was available and who had it and etc et I've, I've read very tempting stories uh, about planes having been uh, upgraded in israel flown back to ukraine and used for the downing and yet i i, I i'm suspicious of that sort of 
line of argument because I'm not competent to judge and the, the basis for it is too thin. But it, it is really... A, yeah, there, there are lots there, of things that oh, are questionable, yes. but some, some yeah, that you don't yeah, want to yeah. bring in because it's... No, and, and, and you can also use some of the things that probably didn't play a role uh, to, to discredit the, the committees that did the investigations. For instance, if you have a security board, the Dutch safety board, which does an investigation of the plane, and you, you, you can read on the basis of indisputable um, bills of lading that the plane uh, co uh, transported 1.3 tons of lithium-ion uh, ba uh, batteries, which are highly flammable and potentially explosive. And it was not allowed to, pr to transport that amount of, uh, of lithium-ion batteries in, on a civilian plane. And the committee, in its final official report, says that it was one battery on the plane, but it was well packaged. Then you, re you realize it may have nothing to do with it. It may even be a slip, although it sounds that's, that's probably over the top. But you, you don't call 1.3 tons of uh, a, a very flammable uh, industrial type of battery, one little battery but, but that was properly packaged. Now, in that sense, there are very many things that have to be mentioned. I even mentioned the fact that Malaysia um, was a critic of Western austerity policies. So that the fact that we have seen the disappearance of a Malaysian Airlines plane over military sensitive area in the South China Sea and a military and a Malaysian plane over eastern Ukraine, you know, that is an element that you should add to the, the subtle weights that are all involved in this in this complex matter and that remind you of the fact that, that it may have been that that these circumstances may have worked to remove certain inhibitions that somebody may have said, well, if, if, a, if a plane has to go down then, because there was also an Air India, and I think if, I'm, if I remember correctly, an Air Singapore um, plane a few minutes away, um, uh, that Malaysia then is selected, so to speak. But I don't know how, whether that worked, but uh, it's, it's, yeah, I can't say it's nice because it's, of course, a very grim, uh, subject, mind you, that uh, apart from the almost 300 people who perished in this terrible accident, more than 10,000 people in uh, eastern Ukraine had already been killed in the most gruesome ways with a lot of torture on the side, etc. A million people had been, uh, were, were refugees, one and a half million were internally displaced, so we're talking about a major uh, humanitarian disaster that would fill all the headlines, were it not that these are people that we're not interested in. They are uh, victims that we don't respect because they they are victims on the wrong side of uh, of, of the equation for, from the Western NATO EU stand. I just wanted to ask you one more question as we kind of you know, tie up this conversation. What kind of a critical reception? Because you're a very you're a published author. Okay? Yeah, yeah. And I'm I'm curious to know what kind of a, a popular reception you've been getting as a result of this uh, book being released. I, I think it will be dealt with by complete silence because it's almost frightening to think that the mainstream media and the government have entrenched in an untenable position. You know, even if if two-thirds of my book is wrong, the official position is completely wrong. It's untenable. There, there, are, f there are violations of the laws of physics, there are violations of common sense and, and, and all in endless ways. To, to backtrack, to, to, to suddenly say, well, there's now a book out and, and for all its limitations it comes with an alternative vision, in my view is impossible. Because that, that would mean that uh, the government and the mainstream media would have to concede to uh, the larger public that they have been lying. Uh, and I made an attempt um, at an earlier stage to actually uh, uh, send a letter to you know a letter to the editor about when when they made a, when they carried something that was was completely out of order, and they replied to me personally with all kind of claims and counterclaims etc. 
but uh, without wanting to publish it even on their website, let alone the hard copy. Uh, and I, I think that is a, a hint of, of what I can uh, expect. The, the best, well, the best you can hope is that uh, I will be dismissed as a sort of crank, etc. But that is difficult. I have a long list of uh, publications in, in very respected sources. This comes out in a major university press in the UK. It has been vetted by top-level uh, reviewers who, who have made criticism, but who have uh, enthusiastically endorsed the, the the quality of the of the work. I mean, that's how these presses operate. They, they hardly read anything uh, anymore themselves, but they farm it out to, to specialists to look at it and, and say yes or no. Mm -hmm. uh, so in that sense I'm very happy it comes out there so that they can't dismiss it because I have always also published with an excellent publisher like Pluto. But Pluto is of course a left-wing uh, publisher and they could then dismiss it and say, well, it's marginal. Said, this is not marginal, this is a main, big mainstream publisher in the United Kingdom. And uh, so I, I'm curious and I look forward to see how it is uh, being... Uh, Received and I, you know, as you always hope in these matters, uh, I hope I won't be the only one who comes up with an alternative reading because I'm sure that I will have made mistakes in the book. That I will have, in, uh, although some um, bloggers who are who know every blade of grass in that area have helped me weed out uh, where I became trapped in propaganda stories that I took serious. Uh, and so on, but uh, there will still be mistakes, and therefore you hope that that uh, we can somehow restore. Uh, it has to do something with democracy and openness and transparency that we can somehow restore a, a quest for for an honest account of what is actually happening in the world around us, and which risks are attached to the current course that we're following, because NATO is really raising the stakes of the confrontation with Russia to an unacceptable degree. And there are far more important things than the border uh, conflicts. For instance, the, the positioning of uh, anti-missile missiles that can also be exchanged for real attack missiles is, is, a, um, is a casus belli almost in its own right. It's a very frightening situation. And sometimes I think, you know, I'm, I'm not a particular fan of uh, Vladimir Putin. But I think he's a, he's a statesman of the caliber of, a, let's say, a Bismarck, uh, somebody who, with a, with a very yeah, rational uh, view of things and a moderate. All the, anti, all the Putin bashing that we see in the newspapers with us and on TV, lies and all. Um, you know, at, at some point, if, if he would really be succeeded by anyone, it might be a person that we... Someone that will make us, uh, make us dream back yeah. <laughs> to the days of somebody that you could talk to. And, and uh, you know, we've seen the interviews with Oliver Stone. Mm -hmm. This is a man who can, who's, who's open to all sorts of negotiations, even from my own point of view, to more negotiations than I think is wise for the, for the future of Russia. But that's his business and not mine. Well, um, Dr. Van Der Peil, I... Uh I really appreciate having had this conversation with you. I think I can uh, say with some uh, confidence that uh, you know, certainly independent sites like Global Research and uh, other independent media will give your uh, book uh, respectful attention for all the reasons that you just mentioned. They so. already did. <laughs> Global Research had a, had a piece on it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I appreciate that very much. Thanks very much, Michael. Thank you for your time. <laughs> okay. That was Case Vanderpile, Professor Emeritus of International Relations at the University of Sussex and former director of the Center for Global Political Economy, and also author of the book, Flight MH17, Ukraine and the New Cold War. He spoke to us in Winnipeg in the fall of 2017. You've been listening to the Global Research News Hour. Our show airs weekly on CKUW 95.9 FM in Winnipeg and on partner radio stations across Canada and the United States. We get our podcast on the website globalresearch.ca. To leave feedback, email globalresearchnewshour at gmail.com. I am series host, creator, and producer Michael Welch. Bye for now. <laughs>